Okay, let's get started. Um, okay, so let, let's handle a couple of logistical items. So first off, um, in terms of uh, homeworks, we've got some homeworks that are still uh, outstanding, uh, at least as of this morning, homework 5.7 and 6.1 are being graded. The solution is posted. Yes? Drop. No. I don't, like, yeah, I don't, I mean, I've heard students mention, there's what, curve? What's a curve? <laughs> We can try that on the next test where you like learn how to do it. You mean like the beam where it's curved, where it's deflected? Is that what you mean? I, I understand that. I'm smiling under the mask. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't drop homework assignments in here. But then again, there's so many of them that no one assignment really matters. It's the the ocean of them. There's still like 30 other, and, and I'll tell you this, I got another assignment that's due, uh, worth 20 points due on uh, next week, uh, sign it Monday, due Friday, but it's a lot easier, so balances out, so. Um, okay, a couple of things. Project submission number one is graded. I have posted those grades and those comments to Blackboard. I would read those comments even if you got a 100 because Largely, if you met the requirements, you were good. But, I mean, for some of you, even the ones that got 100, there are some suggestions that I might have for you that might make your life a little easier when you're assessing project submission two. So I really would look at them, okay? Um, okay, uh, submission number two is up. You can't finish it uh, uh, completely because we haven't done mass 10 yet but you can at least get started on it. Um, and if you remember, back in lecture 15, I posted a video that showed you some Excel tips and tricks that might make your life a little easier when you're um, conducting the, uh, uh, the analysis for the trust. And so I would, I would look through that. You might need to watch 15 again because um, I go through a lot of that math. Um, OK. Uh, 6.2 is due today. I'm going to have that solution posted on Wednesday. 6.3 is assigned today. It's going to be due Wednesday, and I'm going to post that solution at 5 p.m. because we have a celebration on Friday. So uh, I'll make sure that you have the solution to homework 6.3 uh, uh, in time to study for the exam. Okay. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention that has not a whole lot to do with this class, but about next semester, I'm curious if there's any of you interested in taking steel design next spring. Okay. A few of you. Okay. Um, here's the deal with steel design, and I'm telling you this now so that you're aware. The schedule says that there is no textbook, and that is correct. I do not use a textbook for steel design. But you cannot negotiate steel design without the steel manual, okay? Now, what's that? All right, so here, here's how the steel manual works for, for students. As the professor, I go on and I make a request for coupon codes, okay? If you were to go and buy the manual from AISC right now, it's like 360 bucks. So I go in, everybody's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> so what I do is I go in and I request educational discount codes. And then what you do, and I give you those codes, and what it does, it drops the price from 360 to 135 So it definitely takes a chunk out of it. What you do is you go on to AISC's website yourself, you purchase the manual, uh, use that coupon code, and they send it to you directly. But you don't buy it through the bookstore or anything like that. You purchase it directly through AISC. So there is no textbook. My thought is, if you're going to have to buy the manual, I don't want to have to make you buy something else. So uh, I develop all the homeworks, exams, all that stuff myself. So, But I wanted to tell you all that so you're aware of it. Sound good? Now, if you have a friend, a uh, older sibling, what have you, that you want a, uh, a colleague at work, uh, that you want to borrow the manual, uh, that will let you borrow the manual, that's fine. The only two things to keep in mind, everybody has to have a manual. You can't borrow one from a friend. Like, everybody has to have one. Uh, and as long as it's the one that's like turquoise, okay? The manuals come out in different editions. We're using 15th edition right now. So, like, the 14th edition is like a burgundy red. The 13th edition is black. So, we're using 15th, and it's like a... A turquoise colors. If it's the right color and you have your own, you can do that. So, uh, so short answer, I don't have a problem with it. 
I don't know if the coupon code will that I give you will work for an ebook. If it does, and you want to purchase an ebook, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. So, yeah, sound good? Okay. So today is our last discussion, our last lecture on deflections, um, and I want to set the stage a little bit so that we're kind of understanding what we're talking about today. So we've been talking about we, we've been talking about deflections in various uh, pieces of the class. We did trust deflections a while back, and we said that trust deflections are summing up the axial energy inside the the trust members, the little f, big f, l's over ea's. And what we're doing uh, for beam deflections is we're summing up the, the integrated little m, big M over EIs, right? Because the idea is that what we're trying to do is figure out um, the, the deflection of, of the beam based on its flexural energy that it's storing, okay? So now here's our process. I think by now it should be pretty straightforward, especially after the last homework assignment you just did. I know that was a little bit of a... Uh, 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 a slot to get through. Um, what I want to do is sort of generalize the method of virtual work a little bit. So we've been looking at beams. Um, all we've been considering are the flexural effects, right? And for the most part, that's a completely valid uh, assessment. If you have a beam and you're loading it, it tends to deform the most through a flexural-based mode. Or another way of thinking about it is when you take a beam and you load it, it responds by deforming and storing energy. Most of that energy is stored through flexural deformation. And that is a true statement uh, for, for, for beams. But if we're looking at frames where we could have a whole bunch of other stuff going on or generalizing the method uh, for any structure subjected to any types of loads, if we wanted to generalize it, it would really be this, right? So for a general structural system, we'd say that the deflection is the sum of the uh, energy stored through axial deformation, plus the sum of the energy stored through flexural deformation, plus the sum of the energy st uh, stored through torsional deformation. So we might have little f big F over EA, or little t big T over GJ if it's being twisted. What about shears? Little v big V over GA, okay? Um, there's a little bit more of a um, uh, involved mathematical process to derive this, so we have some terms left out. I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, we could also look at thermal effects. What if the structure is going through thermal uh, elongation or contraction? So if we really wanted to generalize it, this would be the general method of virtual work for any system. Um, and when computing deflections, we only consider the terms that are relevant. So like for a truss, when we analyze a truss, we make assumptions about the truss's behavior and construct it to, val or to, to correspond to those assumptions such that when we're looking at truss members, we say that the, the trust members only carry axial load. So if we did our structural analysis, we would find that the moments, the shears, the torsions were all zero. So we would be applying the general method of virtual work, just all these terms would go to zero. All right. Um, does that make sense? So when we're looking at frames, for example, a generalized method of virtual work would be to consider the axial effects, the flexural effects, and the shear effects. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, we're not going to do the shear effects, okay? We are not going to discuss the shear deformations at all in here. Uh, or, no, hold on, let me, let me restate that. We're going to discuss them, but I'm not going to make you do the math, okay? So, so don't worry about that. But I'll show you what happens when you do perform the, the shear deformation com computations here in a bit. So for frames, um, we again, it, the, the process is the same. We perform a real structural analysis and a virtual structural analysis um, where we only place a single unit load at the point of interest, a magnitude of one, in the assumed direction, et cetera, uh, and we can consider axial effects, flexural effects, and shear effects. What we're going to do here in a bit um, is we're going to demonstrate how you can usually deflect or uh, ignore the axial effects. Um, and the, the way I'm going to convince you of that is we're going to do an example. So I have a frame deflection example where we're going to determine the deflection at point A, right here, the vertical deflection, so we're going to place a single unit load downward uh, on this frame. And so for all the members in the frame, here's my E, here's my A, and here's my I. I'm going to need both. Now, I've actually configured this problem so that it's sort of flimsy axially, 
um, because that area is really tiny. It's the members are only about you know like that big around, um, and you're gonna see how axial effects don't really matter. And so if I was an analyst looking at this frame, I probably wouldn't even consider the axial effects. But I want to show you what happens when you do, because I think the easiest way to demonstrate it is to just show you. So we're going to have this problem. We're going to have to do a real analysis. We're going to have to do a virtual analysis, uh, et cetera. Now, I'm going to do something a little different with the, uh, the flow of the problem. Um, typically, what we have done is we've done the real analysis and then the virtual analysis. I'm going to do the virtual analysis first, OK? And there's a reason for that. Uh, there's no, I mean, you could do, I mean, you end up having to do both of them, so it doesn't really matter which one you do first, but I want to show you, I want to get you thinking a little bit. So, and I gave you a little hint on your homework assignment that hopefully makes sense uh, if we do the um, virtual analysis first. Okay. Let me make this picture a little smaller. There we go. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is we're going we're gonna to take this problem and I'm going to do sort of two sets of analyses. I'll do some over here on the left, some over here on the right. Um, and let's, let's take a look at what we got. Okay. So, all right. So let's do the virtual structure. And this is vertical deflection at A, and we're going to say assumed downward. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I look at that frame, I kind of think the point A is deflecting downward, don't you? W would that be a fair statement? Okay. So, how do we do that? Well, we take the frame and we remove all the loads and we only place a single unit load like that. Okay? So this is point A, this is point B, this is point C. Um, this dimension here is 20 feet. There goes the alarm in the hallway. This is 10 feet, etc. Okay? Now, first off, we're going to need support reactions. I mean, can I just give them to you at this point? Is everybody okay with that? Would you agree, just based on what the structure looks like, that if this is one down, this is one up, and I've got one times 20 contributing moment, so this is 20 going like that. I guess if I wanted to be hyper-concerned about the units, it would be 20 feet. Is that okay? All right. So far, so good? Okay. So, what we're going to do is we're going to need to develop moment functions for each of these members. But what we're also going to do a little differently is we're also going to see if we can develop axial forces for each of these members. We're going to see if we can figure out what those are. Okay? So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to develop some coordinate systems. Okay? Now, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to say, we'll say x1 goes like this. We'll say x2 goes like this. So we'll say, like, this is the free end, and x goes along the member, and this is sort of my end over here. x goes along the member. Is everybody okay with that? So we're going to cut two sections. We're going to cut section 1, and we're going to cut section two. And for both of these section cuts, we're going to look towards the origin, okay? So for this cut, we're going to cut a section, look down. This section, cut a section, look right. So let's see what happens when we cut section one, okay?
All right. So what do we got? Here's the member. Here's the load. Here's the section cut. And what do we have when we cut a section, right? We've got three unknowns uh, inside the member. We've got an axial force, which I'll call F, a shear, and a bending moment. I can do better on that bending moment. I don't like that. Is that fair? Right? Whenever you're cutting a section through an arbitrary point in the structure, you have axial shear and moment. Is that fair? Okay. So, help me out. What is the axial force? What's the little f? Or no, what's little f? One. And it's in tension, right? So, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say that little f is 1 and little m is 0. Is that fair? Now, for both of these functions, even though we're not going to we're not going to be uh, need to deal with this from a function standpoint, but these are both valid. From x1 is zero to x1 is ten. Is that a fair statement? Is that okay? Everybody good? Okay. All right. Everybody with me so far? Now, I want to make a point, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and draw the real structure right here because I want you thinking about this. Okay, so let's look at the real structure. So here's the real structure. All right, now the real structure, we got a little bit more going on. We've got this 20 kips. We've got this, which is 10 kips. This is A, so we had defined that is X1. And that's our section cut. That's 2 and 2, and we now have a distributed load on this and this is let's see three kips per foot this is B and this is C that's 20 feet and this dimension here is 10 feet. Now, are you also equally okay if I just give you the reactions? You okay with that? So here's what we've got. We've got this is 70 kips. We've got this as 20 kips, and then we also have a moment reaction, and the moment reaction is 600 foot kips. I'm like, is that okay? Everybody good? Now, would you also agree? because I kind of just glossed over this, but for member A, B, we only need one function to fully define over here and only one function to fully define over here, right? Let's look at this section 1-1 one, because one, I really want this to, to be clear.
So here's the member. We've got, now we've got the real loads. We've got 10 kips, and here's the section cut. And now we've got this. We've got this and this. Now, what is FAB? What is the real F in this case? Ten, right? Is everybody okay with that? Now, watch this. What is MAB? 20x. That's correct. Here's what I'm going to write. Why did I write that? Because the other one's zero. The corresponding function is zero. What am I going to do with these functions? I'm going to integrate this times this. What is this times whatever this is? Zero. And what's the integral of zero? Boom. It's not going to matter, right? So I'm saving myself some headache by just not worrying about it. Does that make sense? I, I did that for a particular point. I wanted to do that first. So this is x1 is 0 to x1 is 10. Oh, hold on. I got it. How do you like that system parameters? All right. <laughs> I'm a dork, I know. Okay, does that make sense? Why it doesn't matter? So I'm going to go ahead and tell you, on your homework assignment, I'm going to have you do a frame deflection, and there is a member that doesn't matter. And I, and I gave you a hint. I said do the virtual analysis first, and you'll see why. Okay. So far, so good? Okay. All right. Now, since we got the real structure sort of in our heads, let's, um, let's go ahead and do section 2-2 two, two on the real structure. If you need me to scroll up, let me know, okay? Let me know. Section 2-2. Two, two. Looking right. Section 2-2. Two, 2-2. Two. Two, two. Looking right. All right. It doesn't really matter which order that we do them in, so... I said I was going to do the real one first, but I don't know. This one has a lot more drawing, and I'm kind of lazy. Let's do the simpler one first. So let's do this one. All right. So when we cut a section over here, let's do let's do the virtual structure first. So we've got this support condition right there. I think we found that the reactions were that this was one, and this was. Which way did I have it going? Yeah, like that. This was 20. This is x2. And then here's our section cut. And so we have, let's see, what do we got? We've got a shear. Oh, these are virtual, sorry. What? No, 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 did I do something wrong? Oh, okay. And I have that. So, 
help me out. What is, and this is, this is, sorry, this is point C. All right, so help me out. What is F, B, C, and M, B, C? Let's see if we can do this one together. All right, what's F, B, C? Zero. What is M, B, C? Is it 20? Well, hold on. Maybe we ought to be a little bit more scientific about that. Maybe we should say, let some moments at the cut. So if we sum moments at the cut, we've got the little m going like this and the 20 going like this. So little m, 20. But is there anything acting in the other direction? this times x2. So m plus 20 is x. So I propose this is that. Is that OK? Everybody OK with this? So now, those are our virtual axial and moment functions that fully define what's going on in the uh, uh, in the internal response for the virtual structure. Yes. So are we doing type of origins by shear? That's a great yeah. The short answer is yes. The long answer is I'm going to show you how shear affects deformations here in a bit. But for our purposes and doing the calculations, yeah, we're not going to worry about the shear. I'm not going to make you do the math. But I want to show you where shear deformations will matter. It's not harder. It's just more. So, Everybody good? So now let's look at the real structure. So the real structure looks like this. All right, so reactions, 70. This is 20. This is 600. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. I probably need to, like, do my diligence on getting that right. Okay, and then we've got got that. Don't know who that is. Somebody's calling me on my phone. All right. Um, and this is three kips per foot. Now, what is FBC? Doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter because this is zero, right? So big FBC is who cares, right? Now big MBC, we probably need to break out the sum of moments expression. Let, let's be a little scientific about that. So some moments at the cut. All right, let's see if we can do this without the collapsing into a point load. Maybe we can do this in our heads. So we've got M. We don't need to account for the V and the F. Now, let's take care of this distributed load. What's the load? What's the force? 3x times a moment arm of x over 2. So I'm just going to put 3x x over 2. Is that OK? Let's draw on. We've got 70x2 going like this. 
and we've got 600 over here. So M, so let's see, what do we got? We got M plus 600, let me move this over here, M plus 600 plus one and a half X squared equals 70 X. Did I do that right? Right, so FBC is who cares? MBC is, let's say, 70x2 minus 1.5x2 squared minus 600. All from x2 is 0 to x2 is 20. Is this okay? Did I do this too fast? Yes, sir. That's a great question. What matters most is that let's take the moments. If you draw it this way here, then you draw it this way there so that they match. That's what matters most. Like don't put this this way and that that way. It, 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 yeah, it won't work. Because here's the thing, as long as everything matches, your assumption will bear out in the end. It's a great question. Any other questions? Okay, so let's evaluate this out. Okay, I'm going to scroll down because I don't want to squinch this. So, method of virtual work. Now recall that E is 30,000, A is 4, and I is 800. I think. I think those were the values. Yeah. Okay. So let me show you how this works. Okay. So I'm going to do the flexural first. Okay, and so the flexural, what I'm going to have to do for the flexural is I'm summing up, you know, all my integrals. So what that would mean is that I would say, okay, I've got an integral. Let's see, I've got an integral from 0 to 10 of little m1, or sorry, little m a, oh, come on, little m a b big M A B DX1 plus an integral from 0 to 20 of little M B C big M B C DX2. And then I gotta multiply all of this by one by EI on the bottom and then on the top 1728. That, that should be pretty simple, right? I mean, did I do that too fast, or is everybody okay with that? Now, what, am I, what can I do right off the bat with this first integral? It's zero, right? This first integral here goes to zero. So all I have to do is say, the integral here let's let's keep our brackets the integral of 0 to 20 of mbc is x2 minus 20 and mbc is 70 x2 minus 1.5 x2 squared minus 600 dx2 Throw my unit conversion factor. Hold on. And then my E I. Okay. 
when you chug this out, and you ought to do this just for practice, but when you chug this out, you should get an answer of 3.36. OK? Everybody OK with that? Now, for the axial, We don't need to integrate. All we need to do is this. Isn't that what we did before? Like for the trusses, little f, big F, L over EA. And so that would be all over EA. Is there something I can cancel right now? Yeah, it's that second one right there. That one goes to zero, right? So all I got to do is plug in this. And so when you chug this out, here's what you get. You get FAB was one. This was 10 kips. How long is member AB? Say it again. 10, 10 what? Feet. So if I divide this by 30,000 KSI and this by 4 inches squared, I'm missing this. I got to convert that to inches, right? And do you know what you get when you plug this in? You get this. That's pretty tiny, isn't it? So what happened, here's what that means, OK? The whole point of this problem was to determine the deflection at A. I propose that the deflection at A is 3.36 inches down considering flexure, but it's 3.37 inches down if you consider flexural plus axial. What do you think most analysts do? They ignore it, yeah. I mean, even if I made that bar like one square inch, it's just, yeah. Axial deformations tend to not matter all that much in frames. Now, what I haven't discussed is shear deformations. I want to talk about that so that you understand what happens. I'm not going to make you do it, but I think that you need to understand the concepts. But before I stop, I want to see if this makes sense, if anybody has any questions. Is this hard? Hopefully this isn't hard. Everybody good? OK, I want to talk about shear deformations to sort of close this out, because I think this is important. All right. I kind of like this part, because it, it it's mathy, but there you can sink your teeth into it. OK, I want to talk about shear deformations. And so the, Here's the deal with shear deformations, okay? So um, what you're talking about is sort of the beam doing this. So like if I had a cantilevered beam, for example, like let's say here's my cantilevered beam, flexural deformations are all about the beam, you know, like deflecting like this, right? The beam undergoing shear deformations would sort of be like if it's doing this, you know, almost like turning, like shearing, like turning into a parallelogram, if that makes any sense. Now, first off, if you wanted to incorporate shear deformations, let's just talk about the math. How, how would you do it? 
Well, you just do this. You just integrate little v times big V. Okay. Now, the math regarding shear deformations is a little bit more complicated. Um, in fact, when you start going through all of your, your integrals and whatnot, what happens is you, you end up isolating this term k, and k is a function of what your beam looks like. Like, is it an I-beam? Is it a rectangle? Is it a circle? What have you. Uh, and so you can derive those k terms, uh, which I'll show you here in a second. But the way that you evaluate it is you just integrate your little v's times your big v's. Instead of dividing by EI, you're dividing by GA. So v, so what do we have? We have big v's and little v's. So big v's are the shear function from the real load. Little v's are the shear function from the virtual load. So it's the same concept, right? You place a single unit load at the point of interest, um, at the point of interest, uh, uh, in the direction of assumed displacement, uh, et cetera. Now, we have some, uh, uh, some additional terms we've got to account for. So G is the shear modulus. So you all know E, like Young's modulus, G is the shear modulus. It's just a lookup for given materials. So for steel, it's like 11,200 KSI um, and what have you. A is the area of the member. And then K is what's what's called a shear shape factor. And so you can derive K values for common shapes. So like if you have a rectangular beam, like a two by four, then your K value is 1.2. Um, if you have a circular beam, K is 10 over nine. Uh, and for I-beams, what we do is because I-beams are really, really thin rectangles, we're able to use one for I-beams. So for like W sections, we can use an, a, a, a K value of one, as long as the area that we use is the area of the web. Just the, you know how uh, I-beams have the flange and the web. As long as we're just using the area of the web, we can take K as one. That's how you do it, but I want to show you when they matter um, as an analyst, when you need to consider it. And software programs will do this for you, and we're, we're going to learn that here over the next couple days after the exam when we start using Mastan. But shear deformations start to matter when you have beams that are deep. Okay, And so what I mean by a deep beam is this. So um, if I have a beam, you know, let's say here's the beam, right? So we'll call this L, and we'll call this D, okay? And so I can tell you how deep a beam is by looking at that ratio of L over D. And a good rule of thumb is that if your L over D ratio is around 10 or less, then you probably need to start considering shear deformations because they're going to start to affect your answer. And so... You'll uh, like, for example, in reinforced concrete design land. If you ever hear the term deep beam, that's what they're talking about. They're not just talking about wow, that's a deep beam. They're talking about the ratio between how deep the beam is to how long it is, right? So, like, even the the Dunbar Bridge, the you know, that's that's deep, right? But it's also pretty long. You, you know what I mean? So it, it it's a little bit of a different story. Um, but when do um, uh, deep, when does deep beam theory start to matter? Well, there's some examples. Here's a good example right here. This is a, a hammerhead pier on a bridge. This is a beam, right? And this is really deep compared to its length. Its L over D ratio is very small, okay? If you're ever in a, um, like a lobby or a hospital, any, any, uh, uh, or a hotel, any, any, uh, building that has like a, like a lobby area or a, or a big open area. Sometimes you'll see what are called transfer girders. So, you know, the normal beams are only meant to support like one floor, but then you have this transfer girder that sort of opens space up under the building, and that beam is really deep. Uh, and, and so we have to consider uh, shear deformations there. Sometimes for lateral support in buildings, we have shear walls, like literally solid walls between the columns and beams to keep the building from tipping over this way. Uh, and those are some good examples when shear deformations really start to matter. And to kind of show you what I'm talking about here, I kind of want to give you some numbers that you can kind of sink your teeth into. You don't. You, this is something to like sort of watch because I think you'll think this is kind of slick. So here I have a beam, and it's got three kips per foot on it, and it's 25 foot long. We're going to say the beam is made out of steel. So E is 29,000 KSI, and G is 11,200. And I want to show you what happens when we start making the beam deeper, okay? So let's start off by recognizing that this is the expression that we're going to use. We're going to uh, sum up our, 
little m, big M over EI, and our little b, big V over GAs, okay? And so what I've got here is a column, the flexural, this is what you get from this, and the shear, this is what you get from this, okay? And as for your functions, here are the functions, right? Uh, they but both of these uh, uh, moment and shear functions. You only need one function to fully define the moment and shear diagram. So it's pretty simple. Um, uh, except for you know, we're, so we're looking at mid span, but we could exploit symmetry, so we can integrate from here to here and then double it for the virtual expression. All right, let me show you something. Here is a W14 by 26. Okay. Now if you compute the L over D ratio, how long it is divided by how deep it is. How do we determine about how deep it is? The first number, right? Remember, the first number is about how deep it is, and this is how heavy it is, right? So the L over D ratio for this member is about 21.6, okay? Now, if you go through and check everything out, you get that the flexural deformation is about 3.711 inches, and the shear is about 0 0.071. So it's only like 1.9% uh, of the flexural deformation. It's not really that much, okay? Now, here's what I'm going to do. Now what's going to happen if I take the beam and I make it deeper? Okay, I'm not changing the loads. I'm not changing the, the length. I'm not changing the material properties. I'm just using a bigger section. All right. Now what's going to happen is the deflection values themselves are going to drop. Right. If I didn't change the load, I didn't change the beam, and I just made the beam bigger, it's not going to deflect as much. Right. But watch what happens. All right. Here's the flexural deformation that you get. Here's the shear deformation that you get. But now, this is like 5% of that. Before it was like 1%, now it's like 5%. What happens if I take it and I use a really deep beam, like a W36 by 135? Its L over D ratio is like 8, okay? So again, the deflection values themselves are smaller, but now the shear deformations are 10% of this. So like if you didn't use the shear deformation, your answer would be like 10% off be 10% wrong. Does that make sense? Okay, everybody okay with that? So, so I, I wanted to try and illustrate uh, what's going on here, uh, that whenever you have beams that are deep, you need to start considering shear deformations. A lot of times your programs, there's a little switch that you just turn on and it'll do this for you, but you need to kind of understand when it's appropriate, and when it's actually going to matter. When you're doing hand calculations, you might not be considering shear deformations, your program might. Is it appropriate? How much is it affecting your answer, et cetera? Does that make sense? I, I kind of like this part. I thought this was kind of slick. So, Any questions? Wednesday, we have exam review. Come prepared to ask questions because we celebrate on Friday. That's all I got. And don't forget Mastan. Have that installed by next week. <laughs>